It's time for the Spoonie One Wrestling Show. It's time for the Spoonie One Wrestling Show. All right, welcome back to a special episode of Wrestle Wrestle. As always, I'm covering the more major events of the year, most notably Undertaker WrestleMania. Um, this is going to be a really, really weird episode. I, I, I know where to start, and yet I know where I shouldn't start, because it's, it's, it's all about The Undertaker. You know, um, it's, it's going to be impossible to avoid spoilers, because I think everyone knows at this point, and um, I'm sorry this one was late, because as I post this, I, probably most of this video is going to be invalidated, because Raw's airing tonight, but whatever, I'm going to talk about it anyway. So, I'm going to start with The Undertaker and then stop talking about The Undertaker because I want to recap the rest of the show. Uh, and yet, uh, is there any point in talking about the rest of the show? I guess is my point. Because when this show goes down in history, is anyone going to remember the rest of the show? You know? And that, that, that was what I was thinking about as I was setting up to record this, is... You know, I remember the rest of the show, but, you know, th that's because I was making it a point to, you know, because this whole Undertaker thing is going to cast a pall over everything else that occurred in this show. Even the, even the stuff that, that people were really enthusiastic about, the best stuff on the show, like, uh, including Daniel Bryan. Uh, you know, finally, finally winning the championship. You know, the, the overarching storyline that was a year in the making, you know. Overcoming all the odds, you know, the superhuman comeback that's usually reserved for John Cena, you know. Overcoming ludicrous odds, uh, you know, finally overcoming the authority and all of evolution, in a sense, which is probably going to reunite on Raw, uh, and, and winning everything. And now, I know what you're going to say. Like, oh, we're, we're going to remember, you know, Daniel Bryan's win for the for the championship. Of course, that was the best thing on the program. But that's not what people are talking about. All people are talking about is The Undertaker. And, you know, I, I'm, people are going to remember the win. It's impossible not to remember the win. Because it was the, the end cap on the show. But what people are always going to talk about, what this show will be known for, what it will always be known for, the number one thing is The Undertaker. You're going to call it WrestleMania 30 is the year The Undertaker's streak was broken. They're not going to call Undertaker, you know, I'm sorry, I even just did it, Undertaker 30. WrestleMania 30 is not going to be the year Daniel Bryan won the championship. It's, it's just not. You know, it, I hate to say it. It's it'll be the year Undertaker streak was broken and Dan Bryan won the championship. It's it, everything else will is overshadowed. So it doesn't even matter. You know, people are. I, I've heard people. Hang on a second. Uh, you know, people are are good show, bad show. You know, what what you think and what I think almost doesn't matter. Uh, this is The Undertaker. All of it. Um, I, at first I was going to say it's going to be the subject of debate for for forever, but it's I, I don't think it really is up for debate. Um, it, 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 opinions are, are polarized right now, but... And this is going to be seem like a poor analogy at first, but when when I explain it, it's it's not going to be. Trust me. This, to me, in my life experience, was a lot like Star Wars Episode One, And let me explain this, because you're like, what the fuck? And I know. When I first got started, when I was writing uh, uh, movie reviews, I wrote for a, for a comic book uh, called Knights of the Dinner Table. And one of the very first things I wrote was uh, a review of Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace. And when I went to see this in the theater... I absolutely hated it, uh, because I was, I'm just that guy, I'm hardwired this way, 
I saw it and I was thinking critically about it. And when I saw it, I I just saw right through it. I hated it. And what a lot of people don't realize or don't remember or choose not to remember is that when people saw The Phantom Menace for the first time in theaters, they loved it. They loved it. When you saw it in theaters, you loved it. And maybe you don't remember that. You, like, for the most part, everyone hates it now. <laughs> right? You hate it now. Everyone looks back on those prequels and go, Oh my god, those, those things were dog shit. Jar Jar Binks sucked. Everyone hated those prequels. Now, everyone talks about George Lucas, like, he's a fucking idiot. He ruined Star Wars. You know, blah, blah, blah. Everyone hates it. No. Back in the day, when Phantom Menace came out, everyone loved the Phantom Menace. Critics, movie critics, Roger Ebert, all the major critics highly reviewed the Phantom Menace. People walked out of there completely satisfied with the Phantom Menace. When I published my Phantom Menace review in that comic book, I got hate mail, a lot of hate mail, overwhelming amounts of hate mail. Um, and I destroyed the Phantom Menace in that review. Today, if I were to show you that review, you would have thought I was, I was probably would think I was easy on the Phantom Menace. I had to watch that movie again to fully, I think everyone had to watch that movie again to fully process just what, because we were shell-shocked. And I think that's why people walked out of there liking it, was we wanted so badly we couldn't believe it. We we walked out of there like we could not conceive. It was impossible to believe of a time when a Star Wars movie might suck. I don't know, if you can put yourself back in that time when there was only Star Wars, you know, Star Wars, Empire Strikes Back, Return of the Jedi, and we saw there was a trailer for Phantom Menace, Oh my god, it was the best thing ever. Like, it did not enter our minds that that movie might suck. It was impossible. It was un unbelievable. Unbelievable. You know? And so, everyone walked out in there, and it was like, it was like, we walked out of there like trauma victims. You know? Um... It, it was like we were delusional and we wanted so badly we we were like we told ourselves it, w it was like we all told ourselves we loved it and we had to watch it again it might not have been until home video that you watch that movie again and you realize oh my god oh my god what the hell just happened you know that's what I mean, is, um, and w when that happened, and I've, I've already promised I wasn't going to go back there, but I, I think what goes down with this thing is, people are going to remember that thud, that hand coming down for the three, that, that thud and the silence, that. And everyone's going to remember that. And that was truly epic. But, what people aren't, don't realize, and won't realize for a while, was that was a moment. That wasn't the whole show. What that was, was... Like, if you were a kid, and you dropped your parents' most valued vase, or you dropped the most precious thing in your family, and you dropped on the floor, and everyone in the family is looking at the broken thing on the floor, and for like ten seconds, there's just nothing. And everyone's like this. And yeah, that's a moment of, of pure, raw emotion right there. You got it. 
But what happens after that? It's not pretty. You're not going to enjoy it. And if that's... If that's what you... If that's what you wanted out of WrestleMania, okay. If that's what you want to call the best of all time, okay. If that's what you wanted to sum up the streak as, okay. <laughs> but that's what it was. You know, that was, um... That was, you know, dropping a family heirloom. You know, that was... That was what it was. And I promised myself... I, 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 even though I was going to talk about this later, but I, I got more to say about this later, but that's what it was. You know, that it was the thud. It was the crash. And, uh... It was the silence. Um... And it was it was kind of beautiful in a way. I was swept up in it, and, but it was a moment. Um, but that was all it was. And it's easy to forget that, you know, people... It, it's easy to, to get swept up in hyperbole. Because it, it just happened, you know. And people on the internet are very reactionary. You know, they're like, nothing else can compare to this. Nothing else in wrestling history, you know. There's nothing else like it. I've never seen anything like it. You know, there's nothing else with that much pure emotion. There has been, though. But you can't put an equal sign on all that raw emotion. There's never been a stunned silence like that that I can remember. Maybe there has. I don't know. I can't remember it, but... but that level of emotion, that's not true. Maybe in the WWE, but you have to remember, when it comes to, like, raw passion, raw emotion, there's been a lot of moments. You can name the most controversial moments in wrestling history, and you you can't necessarily put an equal sign on the amount of emotion that was in a building. You know, like, uh, uh, you know, uh, Montreal, for instance. You know, uh, Hogan's betrayal in forming the NWO. Uh, you know, they were pelting the ring with garbage at that point. Um, uh, oh, shit, I had... But there, there's a lot of moments like that. Um, uh, fuck. Um, I, I was talking on Twitter, and there was a list a mile long of, of moments that were going on that, that were astounding. You know, that that had crowds just either stunned or excited. Good moments, you know, positive emotions. Uh, positive emotions that had the, the crowd on their feet and celebrating Hogan slamming Andre. That was a moment that was brought up in this very show that, that was a major, that, that formed the, the battle royal here. That moment was one of the most uplifting, exciting moments in wrestling history, that wasn't a stunned silence. That was one of the loudest, most raucous, overwhelming, excited. Nobody had done anything like that. Nobody had seen anything like that. That was amazing. You know, everyone was happy. Everyone was on their feet. Hulk Hogan fucking slammed onto the giant. Holy shit. That could not be done. Nothing had ever been seen like that. Hulk Hogan, the most popular, larger than life superstar. Aside from Andre the Giant, had picked up Andre the Giant over his head and fucking slammed him and won the World Heavyweight Championship. He'd picked up the Eighth Wonder of the World and won. That was emotion. So before you engage in hyperbole and tell me that was the most emotional moment in wrestling history, don't think. You know. Now, in terms of, like, tragedy, even then... You gotta think about that. Um, WWE, well, perhaps. Um, in your lifetime, perhaps. But there's been longer streaks when you think about it. Um, again, maybe not WrestleMania, but there's even been guys on this show with longer streaks, like Bruno San Martino, uh, when he lost against uh, Koloff. That guy had been undefeated for a long time. And he never, he had never lost until he'd lost to Koloff, which was a huge, huge controversy. I mean, that was a catastrophe. That guy was unbeatable. We're talking this guy hadn't lost in like decades. 
He was on that guy. This guy was Superman, right? The world was this rocked the world, and I wasn't alive back. I know I wasn't alive. I'm guessing most people in watching this were not alive. I cannot conceive of this. You can't, but like. Just imagining this, when you, I, I, I don't, I, can't, I don't even know how long, but I, I think it was like twenty years or something like this. When you just step back and think, like, and this got, and this isn't just WrestleMania, this is all time, like his entire career, like never losing at all, ever, like his entire record, like not losing. Now this is. It's, again, apples and oranges. He didn't wrestle on, like, Raw every week on TV. But career, you know, he he could not be beaten, you know. Uh, so, But this guy was world famous. And he lost. And I, I believe he was quoted as saying, like, when he had lost for the first time, he thought he had gone deaf from the silence that followed. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? So, this has happened before, and it was indeed powerful. So, what does that say about this show? Let me come back to this. Because there's, there's a lot of factors at play here. And a lot of it revolves around Bar- Block Lala. A lot of it revolves around Brock Lesnar, and the timing of it, and what this means for the future. So let me come back to this and talk about the rest of the show. But again, I wonder what the point of it is. But let's talk about it anyway. First, there was the pre-show, which, as is often the case. One wonders why they bumped this to the pre-show in the first place, because it really was one of the best matches on the entire card, um, which was the the tag team, you know, the tag team title match. Uh, Usos, Real Americans, Rybaxel, and the Matadors. The, the Matadors have... Matadores. Those guys have really stagnated. How sad is it that the most over members of the Matadores is the mini the the Torito the bull, <laughs> wow that's uh yeah not good not good I, I wonder I haven't been to a WWE show but I wonder if they've actually started selling little plushies of Torito I'm I'm guessing not but I, they've honestly they probably should split off Torito and have uh, <laughs> split up the tag team because. Torito is stagnating with the Matadores. Um, why are Rybaxel together? I don't... They seriously are just together because they have nothing better to do. Um, what's what's goofy to me is... Uh, the Real Americans, they have split up now. They were always, I think, always destined to split up at WrestleMania. But what was funny to me is... Ever since last year, uh, WrestleMania 29 was playing on the network just before uh, this one. Ever since Del Rio's babyface turn, the last year of the main event for the world title was Alberto Del Rio's babyface and Jack Swagger, who was still doing the Real American thing. The the uh, racist Real American thing. Uh, the story for that was Alberto Del Rio had turned babyface, doing this horrible, horrible, uh, I, I came from Mexico, but I was made in America, you know, I, I made a new life in America, and this is why I'm successful, USA, USA gimmick, and it was terrible, because to Americans, it came off as pandering bullshit, and to Mexicans, it came off as yeah, I left that toilet Mexico, and America's way better. But but Mexico's cool too. USA, like Mexicans were like fuck you, and Americans were like took our germs. 
So, like, nobody liked Del Rio. And it did more to turn Jack Swagger babyface than anything. So it was really weird to basically have Jack Swagger, the racist baby, he'll be the babyface in that. And the the real Americans have been babyfaces for the longest time, especially since they've given Jack Swagger the giant swing, which is just about the biggest babyface move you can give anybody because people have been calling for it for like six months now. So... What's goofy is you've got the Usos, who are this really great tag team, who are the champions right now, but you still have the Real Americans, who are the bigger babyface team, because every time Cesaro is in the ring now, all they want, all the crowd wants to see is the giant swing. So, every time Cesaro sets up for the giant swing, one of the Usos breaks it up, and what does the crowd do? They start booing the shit out of him. This is not a good thing. So, like... You got people chanting, we the people. Freaking hilarious. So, the Usos win, and they, uh, this is the, they, the, the American, the Americans break up. By the way, the, I've always loved the, the real Americans gimmick has made zero sense ever since Cesaro and Jack Swagger have been together. Nobody has called this gimmick out since it started. Nobody! Like, not online, not the commentators, I think. Like, nobody! It's just like, okay, um, Jack, like, Cesaro just literally had nothing to do. He just, like, Zeb Coulter was just like, ah, I've got this guy, he's not American, but he might as well be, here's Cesaro! And then Cesaro is just with the real Americans now, even though he's Swiss. And he's doing the We the People shit. And he's like, he's not American! But, like, he's doing the shit. And, like... And it's almost like Cesaro was in on the joke. He's just, like... He was always just kind of grinning, like... I don't know, guys. I'm just here doing this shit. And so... It was always just bizarre how Cesaro... He's, he's doing his European uppercut shit, and... He hasn't changed a bit. You know? And so, like... It was just always hilarious to me where it was always just funny. We're like, they ne nobody ever called this gimmick out. And so finally they've gotten rid of this guy. And so he finally gave Jack Swagger the giant swing. People have been clamoring for this. And so that was actually finally paid off well. It's actually been a long time since. It used to be really old school where, you know, you, you always wanted to see, you know, the the one guy would always get away from the heel would always manage to just, just get out of the way of, you know, the the good guy giving him his big finishing move, you know, like, you'd be begging for the guy to finally eat the, the stunner or, you know, the giant swing or the airplane spin or something like that, and finally at the pay-per-view he'd get caught and, you know, he'd eat the airplane spin or something like that. And so finally, you know, Jack Swagger ate the, ate the uh, giant swing. My favorite part of that, though, was, you know, Zab is sitting there watching the giant swing and he's in the corner, you know, hands in his hair. He's going, no! Like, Jack Swagger eating the giant swing was just, oh, no! Like, this was just the most horrible thing ever. Him, Jack Swagger getting spun in a circle, like, ten times. It's over! Ah! You know? It's like the Emperor being thrown down the Death Star shaft. <laughs> You're killing him! <laughs> like, uncles do that to their nephews. <laughs> Zeb, I love Zeb, man. I'm convinced that Zeb's just going to keep growing that mustache out until one day he's just going to start running and then take flight. Yeah. Um... The, I have, fuck, now, now I'm coming down to it. I can, now I'm going to... Oh, fucking uh, Triple H versus Daniel Bryan. Probably the best match on the show. Um, really, really good match. Uh, loved it. Um, finally, this was... When you get down to it, and it's going to seem like I'm complaining, although I guess one can't complain with the end result. The The, the booking for this title feud has actually been really funny when you think about it. 
because uh, it really does seem like they've been reactionary to the to the fans, which is a good thing, really, when you think about it, because it it, it kind of does show that they realize they fucked up, you know, with the with the booking, you know, they've and they've they know when they've fucked up to a certain degree, and they know when nobody gives a shit about you know the title match because you know pretty much I think everyone. It looks like the original plan was, you know, for Batista to win the Rumble and face Orton at the at WrestleMania. And for I, I think the plan was for Batista to be this huge baby face. Like, everyone was, you know, Batista comes back and everyone's like, oh my god, Batista's back! He's the animal! Everyone's gonna love this! Woo! You know, and everyone sees Batista comes back, wins the Rumble, and they're like, oh, fuck! Oh, no! You know, they wanted to see Dana Bryan. And so they just universally rejected Dave Batista. And so, you know, I, I think one doesn't know, but, you know, I, I think everyone believes, maybe not, but, you know, it kind of seems like originally the plan was Batista and Orton, and then there was this weird thing where Daniel Bryan joined the Wyatts, put on fucking a jumpsuit, and then they had this weird thing... It just seemed like they were going in a really, really different direction. Where Dana Bryan joined the Wyatts. And it sucked. And you just... Head scratching. And then, okay, so... And then they changed gears. And so, thank God they did. But, when you think about it... How did we get here? You know, it, it just... It really seemed like emergency scramble mode. They were like, oh, oh Fuck it. Um. Uh. Uh. We're gonna. We're gonna. Uh, the internet had a good idea. Let's. Uh. Let's put. Uh. Him and Triple H in a match, and the winner of that goes to the the, the WrestleMania match, and there's gonna be a triple threat. Which was a really good plan. The internet saved it. But yeah, when, when you think about how we got here, it really was last minute booking, because the original plan sucked. I don't know if 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 we're going with what I think the original plan was. I don't know what the end game was with Daniel Bryan joining the Wyatts was. I'm curious now because because if the only plan was Daniel Bryan joined the Wyatts because he has a beard. I, wow. Because <laughs> that was stupid. And it really did kind of... Uh, it made me reevaluate how cool I thought the Wyatt family was because as soon as Daniel Bryan joined the Wyatts I was like, oh this is stupid why did I want this? Like, I d actually I never wanted Daniel Bryan to join the Wyatts but I was like all of a sudden the Wyatts seemed like a circus act you know it seemed all of a sudden they seemed very very early 90s, late 80s you know they seemed very Dungeon of Doom WCW where I was like who are these clowns? you know and so when people started, uh, when when people, a lot of people were talking about like Bray Wyatt going over the Undertaker, and I was like, ooh, why? You know that that seemed like a bad idea to me. Hang on, I, that was strange. I, I, I thought that was a bad choice. There's a lot of people I would have put against the Undertaker except Bray Wyatt. If you were gonna do that. I would have been interested to see the build for that. I, it could be, it could be done, but man, actually, actually, the build of that would have been interesting. I would have been interested to see the fantasy booking leading up to that. But yeah, um, when Daniel Bryan joined the Wyatts, anyway, uh, really good match, really good. Um, my favorite part of the match, ironically, was I, I always loved um, Triple H had done this once before when he came to the he came to the ring dressed like Conan the Barbarian. This year he came to the ring dressed like Shao Kahn from Mortal Kombat. It was brilliant. He even came to the ring flanked by Valkyries. I was like, this is fucking pimp. I loved it. I was like, even April and April was saying like, she said she would kill me if I ever did something like this. But I was like, I'm going to do Counter Monkey dressed like that from now on. So I got to do a Kickstarter for you to buy me a throne and fucking barbarian armor so I can do counter monkey dress like Shao Kahn. And if you meet the stretch goal, I'm going to rent Valkyries. They're all going to be behind me like that. 
No, I won't really do that. But I always thought that was really cool. The other thing, but the thing was, um, I, I thought the whole spectacle of it was one of the few. I, I thought they really nailed the spectacle of the whole thing. People were like, when when he did the Conan thing before. And when he did the Shao Kahn thing, people were laughing really derisively. And like, oh my god, this is silly. That's what I like about the whole show, is the theatricality of it. You know, I, I really like that. Um, especially this year, what I liked about was they had so many of the uh, wrestlers come out to live renditions of their music. Particularly Bray Wyatt, particularly Randy Orton. So many of them had their own, you know, bands come out. I, I thought the Bray Wyatt shit was awesome. You know, the great stuff. I love that. Anyway, I keep saying great match. A uh, lot of fun. Uh, they did the right thing by putting uh, uh, Daniel Bryan over basically clean as a sheet. Loved it. Could have been better, actually. Uh, but I cannot complain about that match. Really good, although Spoonie hates everything. No. Um, very good. Uh, and they even did the right thing with, um, with Triple H being a really bad sport about it. And... Uh, the classic old school booking. He crushed his arm with a chair. Uh, yeah, crushed his arm with a chair afterwards to make it seem like you know Daniel Bryan is he's impossibly crippled at this point. There's no way he's going to win this match because his arm is useless. You know, it's doubtful he's even going to make it out for the title match at this point. How's he going to win? You know, so that's classic, classic old school booking. Brilliantly done. Some you know, there's nothing wrong with that. Classic. How it's always been done. You know, fine with me. Uh, oh, before that, they they had all the... They had Hulk Hogan come out and flub lines. He's always going to do that, guys. Hulk Hogan is... <laughs> the parents guaranteed every time he comes out he's going to flub some shit. He called it the Silver Dome. Who cares? Um, sorry, thirsty. Obviously. Uh, you know, Rock Austin comes out. It just seemed like a waste of time. It was a big circle jerk. Um, it was really disappointed that Hogan didn't get the stunner, although that was never going to happen. If he, I, doubt, I doubt Hogan could even bend over that far to eat the stunner, and had he done it, his spine would have snapped and sand would have poured out. Although, I, the one thing I was surprised didn't happen was nobody ran into Hogan's fist. I was pretty certain that Miz was going to run out and say something stupid and then run into Hogan's fist. That usually happens most time when Hogan hosts something. He just kind of showed up and did his and then just kind of walked off. But I don't care. Really, for me, less Hogan the better. Anyway, I still uh, love Hulk Hogan. What? I still love Hulk Hogan. Of course you love Hulk Hogan. Everyone loves Hulk Hogan. <laughs> what? I, the funny thing about Hulk Hogan to me is he has come. He, he's a he's a cartoon character. But that's what people want to see, is he's become he's become Dance Monkey. It, what I always said was, he's Hulk Hogan has become. He's imitating me, imitating him. You know, I I, I I'm like, wow, he does a really good. Imp you know, he comes out and he's. A April thought that his wig looked worse than mine. You know he. He's like, wow, his wig looks terrible, she said. And I'm like, no, I, that's his real hair. <laughs> and I'm like, are you sure? And I go, not really. Because I, my, I, the way it, my costume is a bandana with hair attached to it. And she's like, that's impossibly evenly cut. Like, why would you do this? And I'm like, I don't know. But... It's, uh, she's like, that looks terrible. And I'm like, it would be the ultimate irony if he just went into, like, a spirit Halloween and then bought his own costume bandana. <laughs> Wore it. But yeah, he's, the reason, that's the reason you get him, is just to come out there and flex and, and Hulkamania runs wild. Hulkamania hasn't run anywhere since about 2000 fucking one. And I doubt it ran anywhere back then either. I don't know. So, yeah, Hulk when he runs any... He, he went out, he did his shit, and he went back. Crowd loved it, whatever. The, anyway. Then there was the... 
You'll excuse me if I get the order wrong. Oh, uh, S.H.I.E.L.D. versus Kane and the Middle Age Outlaws. I still wonder why, given all this time to prepare, uh, why does Citizen Kane choose to wrestle in business slacks? Like, he's got, you know, he's he knows he has a match at WrestleMania. He's a wrestler. He has the Kane outfit. He's like, mm, slacks. <laughs> Is that just his thing now? He's like, corporate dress code. Got no choice. Ah, I forgot the, I was flowing, flying in, I forgot the Kane outfit. I guess that's just his costume. You know, like, when you're, I, when you're Irwin R. Scheister... You're wearing the IRS outfit when you're when you're Citizen Kane. You're wearing the slacks. I guess that's it, right? You can't be the monster. Obviously, that's it, right? The Middle Age Outlaws do their thing. Um, this must have been cut for time, but this was a complete squash match. I don't think they got a single move of offense in because the Shield fucking crushed them. This pissed me off because even if had it even had it been a back and forth match, this was a waste of the Shield. This, it was, it was well done, but this was a waste of the shield. Not only was there not a U.S. title match on WrestleMania, but you just had the shield spinning their wheels. On WrestleMania, you had three of the best performers in the WWE beating up the Middle Age Outlaws. What the fuck? You wasted the shield and the Wyatts. Do you see the problem here? Two of the best teams currently operating in the WWE right now. I wonder what they could have been doing at this moment. I don't know, guys. Maybe they could have been wrestling. Instead of beating up fucking Billy Gunn and a road dog. Or, how about they do that? And maybe Dean Ambrose... Could have wrestled Kane. Just wild fucking thought. This this was a waste of time. Uh, the only memorable thing about this was that you got to see Roman Reigns just run wild and Superman punch people, and they hit a double triple power bomb. Figure that one out, which is just fun to say. They hit a double triple power bomb. <laughs> it's. They had a trip. They had triple power bombs, and there was two of them. And they double triple power bomb. It's pretty fun to say. Uh, so yeah, they got crushed. Um, Bradshaw, the line, his line was that seemed to be the end of the Attitude Era, which one God hopes so. But yeah, this was probably the biggest, aside from the Undertaker, of course. This seemed to be the biggest way. This really pissed me off. Just the. You had the shield. This really... For a lot of the pay-per-views this year... 2013. You know, 2013, 2014. This was a lot of the reason why people bought pay-per-views. Was to see the shield wrestle. Because they're the most exciting performers. Among the most exciting performers in the company right now. And you threw them in there against Road Dog and Billy Gunn? <sighs> Waste of time, guys. So, once again, when I hear people saying best mania ever, you know, I, I gotta raise issue with that. If only because of the wasted potential. You know, I, I could have... Real Americans and Usos was, was okay. It was, it was good. It was really good, actually. But you could have put S.H.I.E.L.D. in there. I would have done S.H.I.E.L.D. versus Wyatt. In fact, that would have been a really good match to set up. That would have been a really good feud to set up for WrestleMania. I, I'm not saying that the feud versus... Uh, sorry, no, I'm not saying S.H.I.E.L.D. versus Authority was a bad way to go... But the Outlaws? I don't know, man. Ah, the, the Outlaws being the hired guns of the Authority was the wrong way to go with that one. Ah. So, 
Then we're going to the Andre the Giant Battle Royal. Here's the thing. The right guy won. And by the end, it was a lot of fun. Battle Royals always suck. They always suck. Now I know what you just said, because I heard you just now. But Spoonie, what about the Royal Rumble? I love the Royal Rumble. I just heard you say that. The Royal Rumble sucks. I know. It sucks too. But I watch the Royal Rumble every year too. Here's why. The Royal Rumble's fun. But it sucks. Because it... But here's here's why it's still a lot of fun. Because uh, it has high stakes. It plays into the storyline. It's very important because it ties into the main event of WrestleMania. And there's a lot of fun going into it. You like to watch the Rumble because it features everybody. There's a lot of fun surprises. And you like to play the guessing game. Who's going to win? Who's going to be the surprise entrance? And you like to bitch about it afterwards. Because I do too. But it still sucks. Am I lying? Come on. It sucks, and you know it. All Battle Royals suck. So did this one. They all suck until they come down to the last five or six guys, when it pretty much turns into a standard wrestling match. So did this one. So it came down to the final group of guys, and it was it was okay. So, what, fuck, fucking Fandango was there. Fucking Fandango sat there on the outside of the ring. I don't know what the fuck he was doing. Twerking or some shit? He seriously spent like three minutes on the outside just going like... The fuck was he doing? Oh, f I hate fucking Fandango. Dolph Ziggler. To this day, I have no idea why people like Dolph, Dolph Ziggler. They're like, what's Spoonie? He's such a good worker. No! No, he's fucking not. Dolph Ziggler is not a good worker. Dolph Ziggler is fucking insane. Here's why you think Dolph Ziggler is a good worker. Dolph Ziggler bumps his fucking ass off. That does not make him a good worker. That makes him out of his goddamn mind. That makes him concussion prone. That makes him injury prone. The reason you think he's a good worker is because he bumps like a fucking maniac and he makes other people look really good. That also means he's going to be near crippled in about 506 years. But nobody likes to work with him because he works way too fast. He's also really dangerous. And he's not that good. Sorry, guys. <laughs> he's not that good. And he's never going to go anywhere. Zig is might as well shut the fuck up. And he spends this battle royal, the babyface Dolph Ziggler, he spends this battle royal, most of it, clinging to the bottom rope like a coward. There's almost always one guy who spends a battle royal doing this, and it's usually the heel! But now Babyface Dolph Ziggler, the show-off... By the way, show-off, usually a heel gimmick. No, always a heel gimmick. No, the Babyface show-off spends the entire battle royal clinging to the bottom rope like a coward. But he gets thrown out. <laughs> he loses. Imagine that. But what should have been a really memorable WrestleMania moment was really incredible, but was overshadowed by the Undertaker thing, was Cesaro fucking hauling up the big show and fucking slamming him over the top rope. It was fucking incredible. Really, really great moment. 
And when you think about it, something really appropriate, you know, poetically appropriate to the Andre the Giant thing, somebody picking up the biggest giant in the WWE and slamming over the top rope. Fucking impressive. Cesaro is a freak, man. A fucking freak when it comes to strength. This guy is godly. Like, so this guy really had two huge moments when it came to WrestleMania. He, you know, he had the, he had re- three, really. Uh, he, he got to swing, uh, he got to swing Jack Swagger. He swung the shit out of Kofi Kingston. And he got to fucking slam Big Show over the top fucking rope. Um, and th- again, this is where I have a problem with the Undertaker thing. That big moment will almost never enter the discussion when this pay-per-view is brought up. People aren't going to remember. Hey, you remember WrestleMania 30? Oh, yeah, that one where Cesaro fucking body slammed Big Show over the top rope and won that battle royal? Nobody's going to say that. Not unless they're discussing this pay-per-view in extraordinary detail. They're going to talk about The Undertaker. It's a real bummer. It's a real bummer, because that was an extraordinary moment. And I'm, I know people are going to argue, oh, remember that? I'm going to remember that forever. No, you, you, I'm sure you're going to remember it, but nobody's going to talk about it. That's not going to make any highlight reels. You know, it's, it's just not. And it's sad. But that was going to happen. The thing is, and the thing is, that was going to happen no matter what. You, the, anytime Taker was going to lose, it was going to overshadow anything that happened that pay-per-view. Okay? So don't get me wrong when I say that you know, it was the wrong year or it, it was to Brock. Whatever year Taker ended up losing, forget the entire pay-per-view. Forget it. But again, I'm going to come back to that. So that was the pro- that was one of the many problems with Taker losing, was you've just eclipsed the entire pay per view. Okay, so you've got a major problem right off the bat. You got a big problem. But okay, so that's the Andre the Giant thing. Really, really. Fun ending, clusterfuck match, but it's a battle royal. It's, by definition, a clusterfuck. It's just... The reason I say they suck is because for the better part of five, six minutes, it's a clusterfuck. You've got 30 guys, something like that, in the ring, and you just... you. It's just a mess. You just... I, I, don't, I don't know what I'm saying. I don't know... They're just a bunch of... It's just a bunch of thrashing limbs. You know? There's no point in watching anything. They're not doing anything. They're just like... Ah! You know, they're just pushing against each other. There's a bunch of chops being thrown. Nobody can take any bumps. Nobody can throw anyone anywhere. It's just a bunch of... People playing grab ass until... Until somebody gets... Uh, until it narrows down to about three quarters of the field being gone. It's 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 stupid. Um... The big spot, one of the surprising spots of the night, and again, this is something that seemed really cool at the time, but when you think about it, is really, really dumb, was Kofi Kingston's miracle save, and he's always got one when it comes to these royals, uh, uh, rumbles or battle royals, was he gets fucking ejected from the ring. I thought he was dead. He gets, he's running towards a, somebody in the corner. It was probably Cesaro. I can't remember. But he gets launched over the corner, over the corner post, out of the ring. I thought he was just dead. But he lands on the ground, and then he starts pointing at his feet. And his feet are balanced on the ring steps. And he goes, I didn't touch the ground. I didn't touch the ground. They're on the steps. And the ref goes, you're right. You're not out. And everyone's like, oh my god, miracle save! And I'm like, ha ha ha, bullshit. Because, <laughs> like, like you're taking this... It, it, okay, here's the thing. In the Royal Rumble and Battle Royals, the rule 
as they always say it, is you are eliminated from a battle royal if you are thrown over the top rope and both feet touch the floor. We're taking this awfully literally, aren't we? What are we playing by the Babylonian rules of wrestling or some shit? Like, what does it take anymore before we just, like, say, you know what? You're out. Like, he was thrown over the top rope, his head, ass, back, arms, every part of him, except his feet, were thrown out of the ring and collapsed on the floor. But, oh, his feet were in the air. Fuck you, okay? Like, this isn't... This... You can't argue this in the NFL, okay? Like, I know, I'm here I am, bringing the real world into this. But, like, fuck you, okay? Like, there's there's down by contact, you know? <laughs> You're not going to see a wide receiver go, Feet in the air! I'm okay! <laughs> He's down, okay? Your ass is on the ground. You're out, dude. And I know they planned this. They made it look really good, though. They made it look... He, it, it was really remarkable how they did this, because it looked like he'd been... It looked like accidental, or it looked miraculous. But when you watch the replay, he actually did manage to, like, control it, where he he goes, he goes over the top, and he catches... You can see him catch his hand on the post and kind of control the fall. It still looked like it fucking sucked. Like, sucked in terms of pain. But, like, he did control his fall. So, really remarkable in terms of planning, but... Bullshit factor? Wow. But in terms of, like, the Kofi miracle save of the Battle Royal, okay. Like, <laughs> it was pretty funny. But, we, like, at this point, though, we're going to have to, like, he's going to have to, like, tear his foot off in mid-fall and throw it in the ring and be like, one of my feet is still detached and in the ring, man. Like, and the ref would be like, you're right, you're still in there. Oh my god. It's pretty funny. It, like, it's 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 kind of cool that's his gimmick. Although at some point, at some point he needs to win one of these. Because so far these miracle saves aren't helping him. You know? Like at some point he should win one of these. Because of his unbelievable dexterity and skill, he's he just it just manages to keep him in there for like a little longer. He should have a reputation of being like a master of these because really he is, you know, he's got these amazing, unbelievable ro uh, battle royal skills. Eventually, these have to pay off. If I'm booking these, I'm like, you know, eventually Kofi has to just be like this miracle worker. Is come on, man. Like, although he's run out of tricks by now, well, at least one believes so. He's got to be like, he's got to spend like entire bus trips just like thinking of ways to just survive. You know, he's he saved himself on the Spanish announcers table. Although, if we have a French announcers table, like, just think of the possibilities. Like, really, you know. By the way, for, uh, Australian Benzai was sitting right behind Michael Cole. Go back through that pay-per-view, you can see him. He's got, like, a little Australian flag. Australian Benzai is, is right there. He's, he's like... <laughs> he's very happy the whole the whole time, because he's a WrestleMania. Anyway. Um, I, I know I'm forgetting matches. Part of me doesn't care. Because, again... Uh, I guess we'll go to The Undertaker. Okay. Trying to figure out where to start. I guess I've already started, but... <sighs> can of worms. Big can of worms. The silence. <sighs> okay. Number one. One of the big problems that people had was that 
was Brock the right guy? If Undertaker was going to lose to anybody, was Brock the right guy? No. <laughs> no, he wasn't. Um, there's a lot of speculation that, you know, Undertaker chose... I, I, I imagine that if... I imagine, of course, that if Undertaker was ever going to lose, that Taker would choose who he would lose to. Um, and I, I get that Taker would probably choose a guy with legitimacy. Because if anyone has legitimacy, it's fucking Brock Lesnar, a former UFC heavyweight champion. You know, in real life... Yeah, shit, yes, Brock Lesnar would tear that old man into pieces and eat them. Of course he would. Fuck, man, it wouldn't even last 30 seconds. He'd tap that old fucker out and rip his arm off and beat him to death with it. But in the terms of, in, in the context of WWE, we're talking Undertaker, who is literally a wrestling zombie, who can emit fire from his, lightning and fire from his hands. Was Brock Lesnar the right guy to do it? We have to consider the future. And we have to consider whether or not... This is debatable. Of course it's debatable. The two questions are, was he the right guy and should he have lost it all? And honestly, if you're asking me, I don't know. Let's let's tackle both scenarios. If you're asking me, should he have lost it all? I don't know. No, he shouldn't have lost it all. I if I were doing it, I would have had him retire either at twenty and zero for the sole reason that it's a nice round number, or I would have had him retire last year. Or no, I, I would have I would have had him retire at twenty and zero because. Um, because it just made sense. Not to get, actually, not because it was a nice round number, although it was, but because it actually had a lot of closure to it. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I don't think I am, but I believe that was the match that Triple H uh, tried to... Uh, it was the year Triple H fought Taker... Uh, in the name of, you know, Shawn Michaels. You know, Shawn was like, you can't beat him, Triple H. You know, you, you can't do it. And Triple H was like, you know, I can do it. You know, for the, the, the you know, all the marbles, one last time, I'm going to do it because, you know, Shawn doesn't think I can. You know, uh, you know, Shawn, uh, Triple H was like, uh, and, and, you know, actually, no, it was The Undertaker, who the last time they fought, he'd won but he had to be carried out on a stretcher, right? And so, even though he'd won the battle, he felt he had lost the war, and had been eating at him for a year. And so, Undertaker, he's like, I have to know, you know. He's like, I have to know if I can, if I can not just win, if I can beat you, you know. And so, he challenged Triple H to a match at WrestleMania one more time. And so the question of that match was that does he still have it one more time to beat him? Like, because the question there was he's getting old. He is old, you know. Time is catching up to The Undertaker. It's caught up to him. But Triple H, he's still, he's, he's still Triple H, you know, he's still this beast. He's still, just look at him, you know, and Triple H is still strong. He's still going strong and he's right, you know, he, he's right. He, Triple H just got caught. He got caught in that submission and he tapped out, but Taker, he looked like an old man. You know, he looked like an old broken man getting carried out of that arena. He was on a stretcher. And I don't know, man. I don't think he can do it again. In fact, I don't think he can do it again, you know. And so, Triple H, he, he wouldn't accept the match at first because he's like, if we do this again, I'm going to hurt you. Because this time I'm not going to hold back. You know, before I took pity on you, I held back because you're an old man and I just didn't want to hurt you. Yeah, you caught me, 
but but that's because I respect you. If you really want this, I'm gonna kill you. You know, and if you're gonna it, like, you know, this time if you want to beat me, you gotta kill me. So like this time, like you were like, this is gonna be this was gonna be the end all be all of matches. And so by the end of that, the Undertaker won. Um, Shawn Michaels was the referee. There was this big question of was this, you know, some kind of secret plan for Shawn Michaels to, you know, because Shawn Michaels had been beaten twice by the Undertaker. Was Shawn Michaels holding a grudge, or was he working with Triple H to screw the Undertaker because he was holding it? You know, was he holding it personally, or was Shawn Michaels angry at Triple H because he didn't want to? Uh, what did Shawn Michaels not want Triple H to do what he could not? So there was that big question of conflicted loyalties or petty grudges. So, you know, you had that question. Uh, so, but by the end of it, you know, you had this final, you had this, you had this resolution, there was a winner, and at the end of it, you had these three legends on top of the stage. Undertaker had gone 20-0, and and these guys were battered, bruised, broken, and they were on top of the stage just like, you know, arms over each other, just like tired, beaten. And it was the end of an era. You know, it had that feeling about it. These three legends representing the end of an era were looking out at the crowd at WrestleMania. And this was their match. You know, Triple H, Undertaker, and Shawn Michaels. This was it. It just had that feeling. And I was like, this is perfect. This was 20 years. This is the right match to go out on. It felt like something The Undertaker should be like, you know what, this is... I've... This, this, that felt like the moment. And then it was CM Punk. You know, I was like... Nobody really thought... It was just a weird opponent. You know, uh, Paul Bearer had just died, and the feud made no sense. It felt forced. It was forced. All of a sudden, CM Punk was making fun of Paul Bearer because it was, it was so easy to get... It was so easy to get sympathy for The Undertaker. It was so easy to make CM Punk the bad guy because he's, he's obviously making fun of Paul Bearer. Because it was so easy. You know, he's dead, and I'm glad he's dead, and oh, yes, oh, I'm going to cry, Undertaker. You know, like, you know, it, it was so easy for CM Punk to seem like a bad guy, but the thing is, it just reeked of desperation. You know, it was pathetic. It, nobody bought it for a second. It just, it was so obvious. You know, it, it, it smacked of poor writing, because it was poor writing. You know, it smacked, it, and the worst thing about it was, the worst thing about these poor pro wrestling things is when you can just tell it's writing. You know, it would be like, don't get me wrong, again, we know that this is scripted, but when you might as well just hand the audience the script, and it might as well be written in crayon, it's, we just tune out, you know. And you're just like, you, it, when Paul Bearer died, we're just like, Oh my god, they're going to make this part of the storyline, aren't they? And they did. And we're just like, oh shit. You know? And it just like, when CM Punk was announced as the opponent for The Undertaker, nobody thought that he had a chance. Because it was such a mismatch. It just didn't look like the kind of match that anybody really wanted to see. From a physical standpoint, they just didn't look compatible as opponents. It just didn't look right. And I don't think anybody in the world thought that CM Punk could really beat him. And it, he didn't. You know, I just, I, I just don't think it was... It, it was one of those matches that didn't really have any drama. And it, I'm sure you... Again, I'm sure you disagree with me. I just... It came off weak. At least to me. And then there came this one. And this was another one where the builds just came off weak. They built this one completely wrong. Even as far as, like, 
and this is one where nobody, nobody thought that Brock Lesnar could beat The Undertaker. Myself included, nobody thought the entire time. I'm talking to April, 100% certain. I'm telling her, there's no way Brock Lesnar's going to beat The Undertaker. I'm talking to her like some condescending boyfriend explaining football to his girlfriend. You know? Like, there's no way that Undertaker's going to beat Brock Lesnar. There's no way. He's not the right guy. It's not the right time. You know? And then, you know, and then, one, two, three. And I'm like, there's no way Undertaker's going to... What the fuck? <laughs> you know, and so, yeah, it was like this. <laughs> then that happened. So, yeah. Um, but the problem is that everyone, everyone at home, and probably everyone in the audience, was doing what I was doing. Y imagine you're the screen. And I was doing this. There's no way that Brock Lesnar is going to beat The Undertaker. Everyone in the audience, you're the ring here, everyone in the audience was doing this. There's no way that Brock Lesnar is going to beat The Undertaker. Meanwhile, one, two, three, there's no way that Brock Lesnar... I don't think anybody was watching The Ring. <laughs> and they heard, one, two, three... Because there was no drama to it. And this is why there was, and there were several reasons there were no drama to, there was no drama to it. <clears throat> and the writing of it, the booking was so poor, was one of the reasons. And here's a major reason there was no drama to the match. It's because there have been, and again, let me explain this for a minute. There have been too many Undertaker streak matches. The streak thing has been going on way too long. Let me explain. The Undertaker streak match has been a thing that has been a formula for a long time. So much so that you can almost write them in your sleep. They haven't been bad. Don't get me wrong. They've been really good. But the Triple H match pretty much killed the notion of a dramatic Undertaker streak match ever happening again. Here's why. Because the Undertaker has kicked out of pretty much every single thing one can possibly kick out of to the point where nobody buys a near fall anymore. Let me explain. Again. So, like, when there's an Undertaker match at WrestleMania... You're watching this match, and Triple H hits a pedigree. And the ref gets down there and he goes, One! Two! He's kicking out! It's WrestleMania, it's The Undertaker, and the streak's on the line. He's not getting pinned with a pedigree. You're not even excited. You're just like... <laughs> In fact, he gets pedigreed, you're not looking at the screen. You're like, there's no way that Triple H is going to beat The Undertaker. He kicks out. You know, like, so, the second pedigree, the first time it happened, you're like, oh shit, that's the second pedigree. Oh, good. You know, but that was like five years ago, maybe, you know. So, then things start getting interesting, you know. But the first time Undertaker choke slams Triple H you're not looking at the screen. Because Triple H is kicking out of the first finishing move. The Chokeslam isn't really a finishing move even, not at WrestleMania. So, you might be interested, with Triple H, you might be interested in the match, because Triple H is kind of an A-list player. But, like, it's just not going to happen with the first finishing move. You know, because it's kind of become a WrestleMania standard. But, with the streak on the line, the first... Even the second finishing move, they're going to kick out of it. And this has been going on for so long 
that it's not even interesting anymore. So you follow? So basically, the streak thing's been going on. There's no drama to it. To the point where, in the last Triple H match, they were kicking out of fucking nuclear missiles. Like, pardon me. Triple H, pedigrees, choke slams, they were hitting each other with their own, with each other's finishing moves, like, twice. Like, he'd pedigree the guy twice. He'd, like, uh, and this is where it was really getting dramatic. This is where it was getting awesome. It was like, Triple H pedigreed the guy, he pedigreed the guy again, and nobody was like, everyone was like, he's kicking out of that. And then, he fucking, uh, what did he, uh, he did another really cool move. Um, he, he tombstone him, but before he did that, he, like, uh, he didn't choke slam him, but he, like, uh, I think he hit, like, a power bomb. And then you're like, ooh, that's interesting, but you knew he was going to kick out. And then, the big moment was he tombstoned Undertaker. And then you're like, oh, my God, he might actually kick out. He might, I mean, he might actually pit. Oh, thank God. That was the, the third one was the tense one. You know, actually, I think the third one is he actually, he might have hit him with a hammer, but at some point he got hit with a sledgehammer. And that was the big one. That one was a little tense, but you were like, mm, he's kicking out. But then he got hit with a tombstone, and you're like, oh my god. Oh, thank god. You know, the tombstone was intense. But then the Undertaker managed to pull it out, hit his own tombstone, and then, boom, one, two, three. But they hit each other with, like, Four finishing moves, if not more. And so they hit each other with like two of their own and then two of each other's. So like with the Undertaker, with the streak on the line, finishing moves all over the place. The first two, not even in question, getting kicked out of. So like by this point, we have seen so many streak matches. It's boring. And I know what that sounds like from me. I know that seems like maybe entitlement that might seem like I don't like wrestling that might seem like I'm blase it might seem like I'm demanding I I, I, I don't know what that seems like for me but I guess what I'm saying is In this case, combined with the poor build to this match, we see one F5. We're not looking, you know. The match, the match was terrible. And even people who really, really liked this pay-per-view, who loved this pay-per-view, I don't think this is even in dispute. This match was shit. Even people who love this pay-per-view would pretty much... I, I think everyone universally agrees this match sucked. I, I, I think everyone... Yeah. This match sucked. And and people will explain to me, like, oh, well, Undertaker... It's pretty much... I think people are reporting that Undertaker may have sustained a concussion. But whether he did or not, this match sucked. I, I don't... I'm not blaming anybody. Uh... But the bottom line is, The Undertaker is old. Brock Lesnar, he's he's sloppy. These guys did not click together. He might have been concussed, and this match was a piece of shit. And the build was poor. It, it was ugly. And so the crowd was not emotionally invested in it. They knew... The crowd knew that this was not going to get interesting until the, the, at least the second half of the until they they until they had seen you know finishers get exchanged at least one finisher get exchanged each you know at least two really so you know they never they didn't think Brock was going to tap out you know either time he was locked in that submission you know not at least at least not not the first two times maybe the third. But the first two times, they're like, meh, not looking. But they just didn't care about this match. 
even if they love the pay-per-view, this isn't what they paid to see. Bottom line. In hindsight, this may have been ground-shaking. This was, in hindsight. But when they bought this pay-per-view, this is not the match they paid to see. Far from it. At all. In fact, this is one of the least looked forward to Undertaker streak matches that I can ever remember. Um, by far. So, <sighs> stunning to me. So, yeah, I, I, think it's, I think it's a combination of all those things. And the formula of the Undertaker type of WrestleMania match was really what contributed to the shock of the finish. And I, I really think a big part of what contributed to the, the, the stun factor of the end was I think a lot of people weren't even looking. Myself included. I was barely... A, I think I had just turned to look at the screen when the referee's hand hit three. Um, and when it happened, I thought it was actually handled rather brilliantly. Uh, I thought this was done well by the WWE because they let it fucking sting. Just like, because it hit, it crashed. It like it crashed like silent. The silence just crashed. But like it was just like mm, two, and my painting fell down. But like the hand, it was like I I wrote a Facebook post where I was like, and then silence. There was silence, and it was beautiful, and it was. But like, and I, I people post that picture of the of the guy, the black guy with the bug eyes. But what I remember was the silence, because his hand hit the third, the three, and it was like there was no music and there was no bell. At least there might have been, but I don't remember it, because who remembers the bell? I remember the silence because the hand hits three. And it's like the ref. The re I don't think, the, yeah, the ref didn't call for the bell. Because it's like the ref couldn't believe that his hand had fallen. It's like. And it's like his hand had killed sound. And it's, I, it's like he was looking at his hand like. What have I done? Like, you know, it was unbelievable. So, like, everyone, I, I was literally just telling April, like, there is no way that Undertaker is going to. It, yeah, everyone was saying those words. And if that was the if if that was the plan, that was genius, but. <laughs> I, I'll tell you that nobody saw it coming. Um, yeah, so the troll in me loved it, but uh, that's about the only person who did. Um, th there was beauty in the stunned faces. There was a, there was a purity in it. So I know. Believe it or not, I know why so many people consider this uh, one of the greatest ones ever. I know why you love the emotion that spilled forth. Why you... The feeling. I, I, I get it. Because I felt it too. And I, I admire At the time, I was just... I was... I was smiling, actually. It was weird. That was not so much a smile, but like a grimace. It was, it was, a, it was a smile, but like... I, I, I love that emotion. I love provoking that kind of emotion. Because um, that's rare. That's almost impossible. Something that, that pure. 
Um, but at the same time, that could have been anybody. That didn't have to be Brock. Um, yeah. And one wonders if it was worth it. That's my question. And I don't know. And that's the debate. And I don't think that's something that's going to get asked. That's that's the weird one. But yeah, that that silence was something. That was a uh, that was crazy. But if the, yeah, that's something that, that that was that's worth watching again. And if, I did not like this pay-per-view. And it's not. It really despite all the shit I've ranted about, and I've ranted a while, I don't know how long, but I've ranted a while, it is not because The Undertaker lost. It's because I really question the fallout. Um, you know, I, I, I question the damage that this will do. I question the cost, you know, um, I, I question, I just, it's, the Undertaker can lose, you know, he can't, there's, there's ways to end the streak, that's fine, but was it worth doing it like this? I don't think so. I, uh, no. No. And I think that's why a lot of people are upset. In fact, I'm certain of it. Um, uh, would I have ever done it? No. But that's not to say I would not, I would have been unhappy to see it end. I could have thought of a lot of ways for it to end. So, yeah, don't tell me that uh, it's, I'm upset because Undertaker lost. I'm not. Uh, I just think it could have been handled a lot of different ways. And you could have had that moment. You could have had that silence. You could have had that surprise. And uh, you could have had it with a lot of different people. And uh, now... Uh, now, there's still problems inherent with that in the sense that um, what I said up before about it, it still would have overshadowed completely. It would have eclipsed everything else that happened in that WrestleMania. Because one way or the other, seriously, um, the last couple of WrestleManias, the main event has not been the world title matches. It's been the streak. Because nobody's cared about the world championships. The world championships have been essentially worthless. Even today, even today, it's not about the world title. Daniel Bryan winning the world title. Who gives a shit? It's not about him winning the belts. That's even, they're not talking, like, you know, when Triple H and the authority or whatever, they're not talking about winning the title. They're talking about the face of the company. Daniel Bryan can't be the face of the company. The belt is a toy. You know, it's the it's the gold star, it's the it's the cowboy hat, you know, it's the it's the stick of truth. You know, whoever holds the stick of truth. It's whoever whoever gets to do commercials. Whoever gets to go on Regis and, and Michael or not Reg, uh, Kelly and Michael, Regis and Michael. Uh, whoever, you know, whoever gets to show up on on talk shows. The belt is who cares about the belt? You know, that's, that's what I mean. Um, face of the company. Uh, it, the WrestleMania main event's been the streak until this year. And nobody cared about it this year until now, when it's over. So, yeah, weird, weird WrestleMania. Um, really dire. Uh, grim, grim fallout. 
Now, if nothing else, it's generated interest. Uh, it's got you thinking, doesn't it? Um, definitely drawn outrage. Polarizing. It's time will tell. I just am of the, I'm of the opinion people are going to turn on this one. I I'm I'm going to get the feeling people uh, people are going to turn on me for a while. Uh, I think I think a lot of people are going to agree with me, but I think I think the majority of me for in the short term are are going to really disagree with me, and that's okay. Uh, so far, I, I so far I think the majority of people disagree with me quite a bit. Uh, but I, pfft, that's story of my life. Um, that's okay. I mean, it's it's wrestling. Who gave me fuck it? Um, it's it's historical, and I think that's what's. It's storytelling, you know. Um, I just think this is poor storytelling. <laughs> um, I, I think everyone's in shock. That's what's strange. Um. And if nothing else, I think shock is a uh, shock can be an effective tool in storytelling. I'm just not sure it was. The, I'm not sure. That's uh, that's the that's the big thing. I think now is uh, is the uncertainty of it all. Um, Raw is about to start, and by the time this one gets this video gets posted, Raw will be over. I think. So some of these questions may have been answered already, but uh, maybe the best thing to do is uh, wait and see. Maybe some of that uncertainty will be cleared up. I don't think so. And I don't think you're going to like the answers. I don't think I will. Because I don't think where we're going with Brock is uh, going to exactly satisfy the uh, where they could have gone with other people who might have been in the same spot here. Who what else would I put, put in there? I think everyone else has kind of named off the same list of the, you know, everyone else has kind of been like, they could have put anybody, you know, the young rising superstars, you know, the a lot of people have mentioned Roman Reigns, Bray Wyatt, uh, Cesaro, uh, anyone from The Shield, really. A lot of people agree Roman Reigns, because um, I think a lot of people have figured they're putting, they're starting to put a lot of um, momentum behind Roman Reigns. Perhaps. Uh... The thing you have to realize is, um, anyone who beats the Undertaker streak is going to be a bad guy for life. So I would not have put Roman Reigns in that position. <laughs> because if you had Roman Reigns beat the streak, he's a heel for life. You better get used to that. That's why I would have had John Cena do it, but on the other hand... Uh, they're not. They're never going to turn John Cena heel. Oh, Bray Wyatt versus John Cena. A lot of people love this match too. To me, this was not a match. This was terrible. This was not a match. This was the ending to Return of the Jedi, except except with a big fat bearded guy and John Cena. This was terrible. People were telling me, but this told a great story. What the hell story was that? What sto What the fuck story was this supposed to tell me? John Cena, I'm gonna I'm gonna expose the real you to the world, John Cena. I'm gonna make you so mad, John Cena, that you're gonna you're gonna hit me with a chair. Yeah. And then they're gonna know that you'll hit People with chairs, John Cena. Who? Like, so what? Like, <laughs> okay, I'm oversimplifying here. But, like, not only has this been done, like, I believe Kane was doing an angle about this, about unleashing the beast within or something like that, which was stupid then, too. But, like, Bray Wyatt is attempting to do something where he's, like, trying to expose John Cena for the hypocrite he is. Or something like that. So, and, like, he's he's trying to do this 
by making him so angry that he will snap. And attack him when he's down, or hit him with a weapon. Uh, okay. And this proves what? That he's mean, I suppose. I'm just not... So what? What's, what's the end game here? I just... What story does this tell? I just... This exposes him to how. Like, he's a hypocrite for, like... All of a sudden... All of a sudden, he's not this snow, pure as the driven snow, childhood hero because he whacks a guy with a chair. Okay. Let's assume that's true. All of a sudden, he hits a guy with a chair, and he's not... He's not the... He's not the drink your milk, eat your vitamins, say your prayers, Boy Scout hero that, that he says he was. Oh no? The kids won't still love him? They won't still buy his t-shirts? I'm not seeing that. Like, all of a sudden, the WWE won't still promote the shit out of him? They, they won't still... Like, all of a sudden, they won't put him on posters, and they won't put him on the cover of the magazine, because, oh my god, Bray Wyatt provoked him to mild violence? Oh my god, John Cena maybe broke the rules and hit him in the head with a chair, and he got fined? He, he got a mild fine, which he could easily afford, because he has a fucking mansion and a golden toilet? Oh no! Like, I don't, I don't get this! What the fuck story is this? Like, it's not exactly like he's turning him to the dark side here. He's just trying to make him really mad. And how is he trying to make him really mad? I don't know. He's not, he's not even really insulting him. He's not, like, he's not calling him a motherfucker. He's not like, he's not like, hit me, Cena, you gay lord. He's just like, he's just like getting on his knees and like, hit me, John, hit me. And this makes him mad how? I don't get it. He's not doing anything. He's just, like, wearing a stupid hat and sitting in a rocking chair. And there's two big fuckers, one of which, one of which wears a sheep mask. And occasionally they attack him and beat him up. This is wrestling, motherfucker. This happens every goddamn week. Life sucks. Wear a helmet. Like, Randy Orton last month beat the shit out of your father and put him in a hospital. And this didn't make you as pissed off as Bray Wyatt has apparently just done. But oh, oh, now he's threatened your legacy. Oh, Cena smash! Oh! Now he's about to murder this guy with the steel ring steps. Now John Cena's really mad. Now he's about to commit fucking armed murder, like aggravated assault. Now he's got to be talked down from the edge of madness. Ooh, fucking legacies at stake here. Dad's in the hospital, but oh, we're going to fucking laugh and joke and smile at Randy Orton. No, no, fucking legacy here. Yeah, the storytelling for this one was great. Fuck you. Don't. This was a fucking terrible match. This was slow. This was plotting. There was no wrestling to this match. This was just a bunch of pandering. This was a bunch of stalling. And this was a bunch of Bray Wyatt doing his weird, creepy shit, which was funny. But ultimately, that was it. It was a bunch of John Cena pulling a bunch of angry faces while Bray Wyatt was just doing his conducting of the audience, which was cool to watch, but ultimately a waste of fucking time. I don't get it. I don't get what you were watching. I don't get what you got out of this. <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out what... <laughs> I, loved, I loved the therapist ref. 
who is in the ring, he's about to kill, like, for some reason, he's so fucking mean mad, you know, like, he's, you know, Bray Wyatt's, like, on his knee, he throws, he, you know, Bray Wyatt's like, take your steel chair weapon, use it, I am unarmed, strike me down with all of your hatred, and your journey towards the Bray side will be complete, and, like, John Cena's like, mm, mm, ah, ah. and then the referee is like, seriously, this is what he says. It's it's literally what he says. He's like, he's like, don't do it, John. This isn't you. Think of your legacy, John. That's literally what he says. You can hear it on the fucking camera. This isn't you, John. Think of your legacy. And it works. This talks him down. John's, he, he seriously, he, he fucking, he throws down this, he thinks of his legacy. And he throws down the chair. Actually, no, no, he doesn't. He doesn't do this. He's like, he, he takes a deep, he's like, you're right. You're right. He proceeds, he, then he, he's like, I'm not going to hit Bray Wyatt. And then he hits the guy in the sheet mask with the chair, because that's okay. And then he drops Bray Wyatt with the attitude adjustment and then pins him clean. Because it's okay to hit the guy with the sheet mask with a chair. That's fine. Because he's an asshole. <laughs> but it, 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 it's okay to hit Bray Wyatt with a slightly less, pay, slightly less injurious wrestling move. As long as it's not a steel chair. And then... I'm not even kidding you. I'm not. I swear, I swear to God, I'm not even shitting you out my ass. Then the announcers start saying this. They're like, John Cena didn't didn't fall for Bray Wyatt's tricks. He stayed true to hustle, loyalty, and respect. He stayed true to the C Nation. Ugh. They say this. He stayed true to hustle, loyalty, and respect. Gag me with your dick. You have got to be shitting me with this pander 